Please welcome to the stage Atlantic Live's Senior Vice President and General Manager, Candace Montgomery. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Atlantic's In Pursuit of Happiness. I'm Candace Montgomery, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Atlantic Live, the team that brings the Atlantic journalism to life virtually and across stages all over the country. We are thrilled to bring this event to life for an in-person and virtual audience today. The pandemic induced profound changes to the ways we work and how we connect with family and friends. And it ignited a global moment to pause and reflect on our priorities and what's most important in life. Whether you are here in Half Moon Bay or joining us online around the world, you've made the choice to go on this journey with us to explore methods and approaches to building more intentional and purposeful lives. Along the way, you'll participate in self-reflection exercises and connect with other attendees. Before we get started, we want to recognize our underwriters, the John Templeton Foundation and Tito's Handmade Vodka for supporting the Atlantic journalism. We've assembled an amazing lineup of scholars, medical practitioners, and business leaders to help us deepen our understanding of what drives happiness, how to apply the practices of happiness to your life, and ways to share joy with others. A few practical notes. Please silence your cell phones, but don't put them away. We want you to participate online. You can be a part of the conversation while posting on social using the hashtag Atlantic Happiness. And to our virtual audience, you can join the conversation by submitting questions by the Q&A tab on your screens. Now we'll kick off the day with a series of conversations and presentations dedicated to the understanding of happiness. Enjoy. Here to discuss happiness and the narrative of your life, please welcome Arthur C. Brooks, contributing writer for The Atlantic. What a delight. Welcome to the Happiness Festival. I'm so happy to be with all of you here and to be in person and to have this beautiful place where we can share these ideas. I am the happiness correspondent for The Atlantic. I teach happiness at Harvard University. What a life. What a beautiful opportunity it is to talk about something that's so important to all of us. I want to tell you about the, very quickly, about the genesis of our happiness work at The Atlantic. Thank you. Which started with a conversation that I had with editor-in-chief Jeff Goldberg about three years ago, two and a half years ago at this point. Uh, Jeff had been reading my work on The Atlantic. We were having, I'm sorry, on happiness. We were having lunch in my office. I was running a think tank back in the old days. And he said, why don't you bring your happiness operation in a column over to The Atlantic? And I said, why would I do that? Why would I bring the science of happiness to The Atlantic? And he said, because The Atlantic is not an, uh, a, a, a magazine of punditry and not a magazine of entertainment. It's a magazine of ideas. And the ideas are happy, of happiness are the ideas that animate us the most. And that was the beginning of what has culminated now in this. And you are part of the inaugural group of people that are starting what we hope to be a movement, a movement that will inspire hope for people all around this country, that will renew the greatness and goodness of our country and be a beacon of light for people around the world. This is not just about feeling good, my friends. This is about doing good with our lives, having meaning for ourselves and for other people. Truly, we see this as a social movement. You and me, all of us together. And all of you who are online joining us, thank you for that. Now, let me tell you briefly about how I became interested in dedicating my life as a social scientist. I'm a, I'm a nerd with a PhD dedicated to understanding human behavior. And I dedicated it to human happiness, and let me tell you why. Ten years ago, I was a CEO. I had been a college professor for a long time, but then I went to run a, a large think tank in Washington, D.C. And it was a good life, as far as it went. My job was raising $50 million a year in philanthropy. It was giving 175 speeches, traveling around the country. My job was basically like running for the Senate and never getting elected. <laughs> and 10 years or so, I found myself on an airplane having a little bit of a an existential crisis, asking myself, so, friend, I said to myself in my head, what's the end game? Where do you want to wind up? 
I was 48 years old at the time. Where do you want to be at 58, at 68? More trips, more speeches, more fundraising? Or is there something to it? Are you going in a particular direction? Now, I thought that sooner or later, just ambling on my way, I would find my happiness. <laughs> Interestingly, as a behavioral social scientist, I'd never answered that question for myself. And, and what changed my, 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 the direction of my life that night on a plane from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., was the conversation that I heard right behind me. See, it was dark, and most people were, you know, drinking on an airplane at night, you know, watching a movie, sleeping perhaps, but not the couple behind me. I could tell by their voices that it was a man and a woman. I could tell by their voices that were quite elderly. And I sort of figured they were married. And you'll see why in a second. Now, the husband was kind of mumbling. I couldn't quite make out his words. But, <laughs> but the wife's voice was very penetrating. It went right through the seats, and I could hear everything she said. And so I heard the husband. She said, the husband said, mumble, mumble, mumble. And the wife said, oh, don't say it would be better if you were dead. <laughs> now they have my full attention. See, as a social scientist, my laboratory is an overheard conversation here and there. <laughs> Careful what you say behind me, because it might become a book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he mumbled some more, and, and she said, it's not true nobody remembers you. It's not true nobody loves you anymore or will even take your calls. This went on for 20 minutes. He was disconsolate. And she was consoling him. I thought to myself, who is this guy? Look, I'm trained in understanding people. So I thought, this is a person who's not, who is he not? He's not you. He's not somebody who's in charge of his life. He's actually disappointed probably by the opportunities he didn't have, the, 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 the things he didn't exploit. He probably didn't get the education that he wanted, start the business that he dreamed about. He probably didn't get the promotions. And he didn't have the ambition he should have had. And now he's probably in his late 80s, and it's near the end. Made sense. Well, an hour later or so, we landed at Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., and the lights came on, and we all stood up, and I was curious. So I turned around, and it was one of the most famous men in the world, somebody you all know, for his adventures and exploits and heroic acts in the 1960s and 70s. Long time ago. But I thought to myself, I was wrong a minute ago. Because I was laboring under a false understanding of the source of happiness. How do you get happy? Here's what the world tells you. Here's what your brain tells you. Do a lot. Be successful. Achieve. Earn. Bank it. And enjoy it for the rest of your life. And that, my friends, is wrong. That's just as wrong as making a bunch of money and then hoping it just lasts you for the last 50 years of your life. That's not the way to be happy. That's not even especially the way to be prosperous. We need a better investment strategy than that. And that <laughs> answered the anxiety I was feeling in my own life. Look, I'm never going to be as great as that man, never as rich, never as famous. But I was going in that direction. And I saw myself at 85 years old explaining to my long-suffering wife, Esther, that I might as well be dead. And she would say, oh, it's not true. <laughs> What can I do, I said to myself, as a social scientist, how can I build the investment portfolio to avoid that? It was selfish. But it led me on a journey that leads me here to talk to you, fellow strivers, about how we can design our lives so that we can be hope for others and happy for ourselves. That's what I want to talk about. Let me tell you a little bit about the research that ensued and what it taught me and how it's changed my life. Now, I ask my students on the first day of class. I teach at the Harvard Business School. And, and I teach a class on happiness. And on the first day of class, I say, they're average age 27. And I say, 10 years from now, are you going to be happier or unhappier than now? They all say, oh, I'm happier. I say, why? Well, my student loans will be paid off. They say, I'm going to have, you know, I'll have my family situation figured out. You know, I'll probably be in love and maybe I'll have kids and family life sounds great. I'm thinking, yeah, just wait. And then um, <coughs> they, say, they say that I'll be solid in my career and making some good money and it'll be better. 37 will be better than 27. By the way, they're at the Harvard Business School. They're optimists. 
they wouldn't be there if they weren't optimists. And I say, okay, now imagine yourself at 47, happier or unhappier? Like, probably even a little happier. I say, okay, now imagine yourself at 77. They're like, I don't want that. <laughs> I say, how come? They say, well, it doesn't sound fun to be old. They can't come up with anything better than that. And I say, okay, what you're telling me is that you're going to get happier and happier and happier, and then you're going to get unhappier and unhappier and unhappier. They're like, yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> I say, okay, let's look at the data. I have data on the average change in happiness over the lifespan for 416,000 citizens in the United States and the UK. Now, no sleight of hand here. I have data on India, on China, on Sub-Saharan Africa, on Australia, on South America, every place in the world, and it all looks the same every place. And that's what you have in front of you right here, which I show to my students, and they say, oh. Now, this is not as catastrophic as it looks. This is on a 1 to 10 scale how happy you would assess your life where one is misery and 10 is the happiest person you ever met, and all of the action is on average between 7 and 9. So this is not, you know, 9 to 1. This is just a diminution. What happens? For the average person, happiness tends to decline from early 20s until early 50s. Now, not everybody, like we like to say, I'm an economist after all, your results may vary. <laughs> but probably not very much. And what do you find is it declines. Why? Well, number one is everybody thinks that circumstances are going to make them happier. And then when they don't, because circumstances don't do it for reasons I'm going to tell you about a little bit later, that it's disappointing. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The second is something physiological that we don't quite understand. There's new research emerging on the, on the neurophysiology of chimps and macaques. And what we find is that they exhibit symptoms of declining mood as they get into middle age. It turns out for a, a male chimpanzee who's middle aged, the easiest thing to teach him is how to smoke. <laughs> give me something, man. Yeah. But the biggest reason is what we euphemistically refer to as family complications. It turns out that they're generally speaking, not for everybody, but for a lot of people, there's a bit of a a marriage malaise between 20 and 30 years, and it coincides with the, the scourge of family life, which is commonly known as teenage kids. <laughs> now, if you notice the big dip in there, this is, you know, 45 to 53 or something, and some of you have, you know what I'm talking about here. When I was doing this research, when I was in my late 40s and early 50s, um, I, my, I, my kid, I had three teenagers at the time, three teenagers, and my middle son, my middle son, it's always the middle son, you know, it's the middle, it, they always, you know, they take up 90% of the family oxygen, but think they're getting 10%, and <laughs> this is my middle son, Carlos, and Carlos, you know, it was always the same problem, it was this grades problem, this grades problem, and so he's failing math, you know, he might not, I mean, he's, he's not passing Latin, I mean, Latin, I never studied Latin, but you got to pass it. And to, if you want to graduate from high school, and I was explaining this again and again, and we were like frequent flyers in the principal's office. And finally, it, we were at wit's end, and my wife, who's from Barcelona, she's an optimist. She says, think of it this way. At least we know he's not cheating. <laughs> <laughs> but then it turns around. Because almost everybody starts getting a boost in mood in from early to mid-50s until late 60s or even early 70s. This is the renaissance period in most people's lives. Now, there are two cases where you don't, which is substance abuse addiction, a addiction and, and mental illness. But uh, apart from that, almost everybody gets happier from, from mid-50s, early 50s until, until late 60s. And then it looks like it kind of flattens out and that's the way it's going to be till the end. Now, that's an illusion, it turns out. Let me show you what's really going on in the data. The first part is really right. You decline until about 53, you increase until you're in your late 60s, but then what's really going on is the population breaks up into two groups. Half gets happier and happier all the way to the end, and the other half starts all the way back down. Half and half. Okay. You know what I want to be. Top half. Top branch, you too. That's my research, right? Because the guy on the plane was clearly on the bottom branch. Now, he's got to be an outlier after all that success. How can it be possible that somebody so successful would wind up on the lower branch? And it turns out that a lot of them do. Let me introduce you to the work of a married couple of social psychologists at the University of Texas at Austin. 
Charles and Carol Holohan, who do work on high achievers. They do work on you, fellow strivers. They do work on people who are identified as high achieving, hard workers, smart, capable early on, and who make the most of it. Now, maybe some of you had a, a hitch here or there early in your lives. I certainly did. I was invited to pursue my excellence outside of the university in my freshman year in college <laughs> by the university. <laughs> you know, at this point, it sort of dropped out, kicked out, split in hairs, you know, as I figure. <laughs> After that, I spent 10 years, my parents called it my gap decade. <laughs> you know? But the bottom line is we were working hard, and people saw lots of promise in us. It turns out, according to the Holohans, that the people who are identified as the big achievers and who work hard and achieve a lot early in their lives, they're the most likely to be disappointed at their lives in the last decade. Oh, the bitter irony they tend to be precisely on the lower branch, which is where I was heading and where the man on the plane was. And when you study the biographies of some of the greatest women and men in history, they were there too because nobody talks about how happy they were in the last decade of their life. Let me introduce you to somebody we all know, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is on the list of the three greatest scientists of the past 500 years, no matter who you are, because he changed the way that we understand natural life forever. He did so, by the way, at age 27, at the end of a naturalist expedition around the world on a sailing ship called the Beagle. He came back after collecting samples of plants and animals and dropped an intellectual atomic bomb, which was, at age 27, his theory of natural selection, the theory of evolution, which we take for granted today, changed the way everything was seen. He became immediately the most famous, celebrated scientist in all of Europe. Rich, famous. He loved it. Who wouldn't? He dined out on it. But then, 25 years later, book after book, party after party, fortune was made. It all stopped. The party stopped. Because he couldn't continue in his own research because his mathematical abilities could not keep up with his own field. Literally, he needed what we today call genetics, which is a highly mathematical and statistical field, and was being explored in the language of German. And Charles Darwin just didn't have the abilities, and so his progress stopped. He spent the last 20 years of his life complaining to his friends that he was disappointed at his own success. He wrote this a year before he died. I'm rather despondent about myself. I have not the heart or strength at my age to begin any investigation lasting years, which is the only thing which I enjoy. He could have been the man on the plane. We remember him as a great hero. He was buried at Westminster Abbey as a hero. And he died feeling himself a disappointment because he was a case study. He was on the lower branch. Now, I have studied as an economist people who waste their gains early in life. And here's the bottom line. If you're really, really successful early on in life, good for you. Get a 401k. <laughs> Save your money for Pete's sake. But you know what? There's no 401k for happiness. And that's what we need as well. This is where the research took me, the happiness 401k plan. And I want to tell you about the three things that the people who have cracked this code, who are successful in their lives and happy in their lives at the end, the things that they did. This is the happiness retirement plan, investment one. Actually, here's three. Get on your second curve of life. Stop adding to your life and start taking things away. And finally, tend to your roots. Let me tell you what I mean by these things. Now, a lot of this is this new book that I'm talking about called From Strength to Strength, which is an ancient Jewish blessing from the 84th Psalm. Michael el Chael. May you go from strength to strength. <laughs> which is exactly what the man on the plane would have wished for and which we all want for ourselves and for others. How do you do it? With this plan. And it starts by getting on your second curve. Now, here's the problem that the man on the plane had, that Darwin had, that a lot of people had. They have what we call the striver's curse. 
The Strivers Curse is the phenomenon in which you get better and better and better at doing what you're doing all the way through your 20s and 30s. Why? Because of a phenomenon called fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence is your innovative capacity, your working memory, your indefatigable energy, your ability to focus laser-like. And you know what it's like. Where you know, you're the star litigator, you're the financial professional, you're good at the accounting firm, you're better and better as a surgeon, you do your thing. I don't care if you're an electrician or a bus driver, whatever you do, with fluid intelligence and 10,000 hours, you can excel and be noticed as a result, and it's fun. Here's the problem. Fluid intelligence, according to the social psychologists, and according to the structure of the prefrontal cortex of the brain, increases through your 20s and 30s with effort, but it peaks, usually between the late 30s and early 40s, and then it starts to decline. What used to be easy becomes hard. What used to be hard becomes a little bit impossible. And in any case, it's less fun. It's a weird thing. You know, you know what this feels like in your mid-40s where you're like, I used to like it more, and I like it less now. It feels like burnout, maybe. It feels like losing focus. You know this feeling? I sure do. I remember this. And, you know, this is when your 45-year-old hotshot dentist starts taking Fridays off. It's like, why are you taking Fridays off? It's like, I don't know. It's just, you know. What's going on is that your dentist is not getting better as a dentist anymore and suddenly finds that she likes it less. <laughs> this happens to all of us. This is natural. This is the structure of the brain. And if this is all there is in life, and you ride this curve all the way down and feel aggrieved about your past successes, woe be unto you. This is Charles Darwin. This is the man on the plane. This is the striver's curse that we find from the burden of high achievement early. Now, the man who studied this phenomenon is the social psychologist, by the way, here's fluid intelligence, <laughs> right? <laughs> Interesting, because he's a little bit older than 20s and 30s at this point but the complex problem solving and working memory. This fluid intelligence was first identified by this man, Raymond Cattell, the social psychologist from Great Britain, who started to write about this early in the 1950s and, and, and really developed his theories of this in the 1960s and 1970s. But here's the interesting thing. Sure enough, he showed, is falling like a rock in your 50s. But that's not where his story finished, because that's not the only kind of intelligence. Here's the thing that the striver's cur curse misses and the frustrated people in the last decades of their life miss. There's a second curve behind it. There's another kind of intelligence that comes later. If you look for it and you develop it, which is called crystallized intelligence. The first was your Elon Musk curve. The second is your Dalai Lama curve. And what do we know about this crystallized intelligence, according to Raymond Cattell, and much subsequent research that has followed this since? It's not about your working memory and your ability to solve problems quickly. Any problem you can solve quickly. It's about the ability to answer the question, is this problem worth solving? It's your wisdom curve, your accumulated knowledge and experience, your wisdom, your judgment, your teaching ability, your ability to recognize patterns, and it increases with age. Have you noticed? if you're anything around my age, that early on you were able to crack any case, you could figure things out, and now you can explain anything? You're weirdly a better mentor than you used to be. Why is it that at my university, at Harvard University, uniformly the best teaching evaluations go to professors over 70? Is it pity on the part of the students? <laughs> they have no pity. <laughs> it is because teaching ability is about crystallized intelligence. Weirdly, when I first finished my PhD, I was writing papers that were so mathematically complex that I can't read them today. <laughs> and yet today, the, the corpus of what I do as a, as a research social scientist is to write a column for the Atlantic for 300,000 people a week. These are not specialists. These are not academics. They're us, people who are simply looking for the secrets of happiness, and they want it based in neuroscience, and they want it based in social science, but they want it written in a way that they can understand. I am teaching in the Atlantic every Thursday morning. What a privilege it is, because I am sitting on my crystallized intelligence curve. Let me show you what these curves look like. Fluid intelligence increases through your 20s and 30s and starts to decline. Your crystallized intelligence is backfilling it if you know where to look. It's increasing, and it crosses sometime in your mid-40s, if you're like most people. Again, 
There's variance on this, but this is generally speaking the way it works, and it stays high through your 50s and 60s and 70s. Why is it that America's greatest historian until very recently, David McCullough, was writing his best books in his, in his mid, mid 80s? The reason is because the data show that crystallized intelligence, generally speaking, is peaking at about age 65. And the better quality of your work is in the second half after 65. If you're a historian, if you're a professor, take care of your health, because you're going to do your best work in your 80s if you really sit on this crystallized intelligence curve. Now, what does crystallized intelligence mean for you? I'm literally a professor. But it means something else for you. Because you have the professor in you in some way. You have the team leader. Maybe you are a, a startup entrepreneur. The crystallized intelligence is the venture capitalist. Maybe you are the star litigator. The crystallized intelligence is the managing partner. Maybe you are the data scientist. Now you're leading the team. Find your crystallized intelligence. Get on your second curve. Early on, rely on fluid. Then later, rely on crystallized and focused on instruction. Are you doing that? That's investment one. Investment two. Five years ago, I was in Taiwan. I was doing a lot of work in Taiwan at the time. And I was visiting the National Palace Museum which is the world's uh, most, the greatest exhibition of Chinese art and artifacts from 8,000 years ago into the present. Now, I know well enough when you visit something as vast as any museum like along these lines, that if you don't go with a guide and you don't spend a little bit of time learning about just a few things, you'll walk through pots and prints and the only thing you'll remember later on is the snack bar. So I got myself a guide, a philosopher actually, who is well versed in the philosophy of art both east and west. I was looking at a, a, an enormous jade structure, a, a carving of a, a Chinese village. Beautiful, green, shiny, incredible. And I said, why is it that even if I knew nothing about this, I would know it's Chinese? And he said, here's the answer. Answer this question and you'll know. He's very elliptical in this way. He's a philosopher after all. He said, what do you think of when I say a work of art yet to be started? And I said, I don't know. An empty canvas? I said, right. You know what we think of, of art that is not there yet, yet to be completed? I said, what? He said, a piece of jade that has what you're looking for already inside it. You think of art as starting from nothing, and the culmination of the brush strokes creates the art. We think of art as already being created inside the block of wood or jade or marble or stone, and then we simply need to take away the parts that are not that Sculpture. Michelangelo said that one time. The Chinese artists live this. He said, this actually explains a whole lot about the Western lifestyle. I said, what do you mean? He said that sometime around your mid-40s, with that, with that canvas, is starting to get a little bit full. Huh. I thought to myself, you know what my, at that time, you know what my life looks like? That. <laughs> By the way, that's Jackson Pollock. Um, and that just sold for $30 million. Um, but here's the point. You add a brush stroke to this, it doesn't get better. After a certain point in your life, it's done, and it's done a lot sooner than you think. This is the reason that people say, I don't know, I just want something. I'm not satisfied. Maybe I'll get a boat. <laughs> just another brush stroke. What do you need? You need a, what do the happiest people later in life, what do people on their second curve do? They change the metaphor. They start chipping away. They started with adding, and then they start chipping away. Because this is where you want to end up. And you don't get that by adding. You only get that by taking away. Sometime in the middle of your life, you need to go from the canvas to the jade. So here's the question. Let me give you one more thing to look at here. Here's the idea in maybe slightly more Western terms that my MBA students like. You think that to find satisfaction in your life, you got to add more. You got to have more halves. You got to have what you want. But that's the wrong model. So here's the right model of satisfaction. It's what you have divided by what you want. I've been working for the last 10 years closely with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And he told me when he was speaking to my students, he was the guest speaker in my MBA class, he and his, from, by Zoom, even the Dalai Lama is on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
he was speaking to my students and 14 million people around the world. And I asked him, your holiness, what is the secret to lasting and stable satisfaction? And he said, not to have what you want, but to want what you have. Your satisfaction is what you have divided by what you want. The secret is not to have more in the second half of your life. The secret in the second half of your life is to want less. This is what you're looking for. This is the Yungan Grottoes in Western China. In 453 BC, it was, it was completed at the end of 70 years at the work of 10,000 stone-cutting artisans. That's seven stories tall. It took millions of years to build up the mountain that that's in, and it took the great effort of true artists to chip away the mountain to find that within. Your job, in the second half of your life in particular, is to find that within the mountain that you have built. Investment two. Early on, add. Later on, subtract. What do you need to subtract this year? Make it your project. This year on your birthday, throw out your bucket list and make a reverse bucket list. All the attachments you want to shed. And finally, your journey is a solitary one as a striver. I talk to people all the time. You know, we, I quoted the 84th Psalm early on. He goes from strength to strength. But, but this first psalm really talks about, and, and this is the word where, where, where King David is, is creating an elegy for the righteous man. The righteous man is like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and who prospers in all that he does. This is great. This is wonderful. It's solace for others, but it's a solitary existence to be sure. I was reading this and thinking about this when I was in Aspen, Colorado, where I, I met some of you. And I, I was looking at the beautiful aspen tree, thinking the stately aspen, solitary, sometimes perhaps even lonely, the price of being successful. But then a friend of mine who's more sophisticated in botany than I am said, that's actually a terrible metaphor. And I said, why? He says, because the aspen tree is not a plant. I said, yes, it is. He said, it's not a single plant. The aspen tree is actually one plant across an entire stand. And he told me about this. The world's largest living organism is a stand of aspens that's 106 acres, 6 million kilograms of wood in Utah. That's one plant, one single organism. Every seemingly solitary tree is one shoot coming out from the same root system. Here's my point, my friends. If you are a striver, you will tend to think of yourself as an individual. That is an illusion. You are not a single individual. All of you here today and me, we are part of the same root system. Do you want to grow older and be happier? Do you want to be on the upper branch of your own tree? Then you need to cultivate not the leaves, not this individual shoot. You need to cultivate your root system, which is what all happy people do and what all strivers, what many strivers, what they forget. Don't go it alone. Your true self, not the sum of your achievements, your true self, the reality of yourself, is the sum of the love for the people in your life. Who did this right? Who did these three things? I told you about Darwin, but I got to give you a better example than that. It was this man. I made my living as a musician for many years, from when I was 19 until I was 31 years old, as a French horn player, many of, it in, of those years in the Barcelona Symphony. And my favorite composer was Johann Sebastian Bach. Johann Sebastian Bach was just like Darwin. He was the, the toast of his generation, the most innovative mind of the high Baroque. The, 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 the money and the, the glory and the commissions poured in from princes and royalty, the toast of the town. But at age 50, his progress stopped. He didn't know he had come to the end of his fluid intelligence, but he did because he was overtaken by a style of music, the classical style of music, that rendered the high Baroque as anachronistic as we think of disco is today. <laughs> Ironically, it was ushered in by his own son, the new style, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. His own son supplanted him as the greatest composer of the generation. Now, Bach could have been like Darwin, trying to live the past, aggrieved about his lost glory, but no, no, that's not what Darwin did. That's not what Bach did. Bach recrafted his career as the greatest composer of his generation who was a teacher. He dedicated himself to teaching the organ, to teaching composition, to teaching the chorus less sexy, less rich, less glorious, 
but happier because he was serving other people. He was truly on his crystallized intelligence curve. And the older he got, the happier he got. Bach died happy. Here's what was happening in the moment of Bach's death. He was literally writing a textbook for his students to memorialize the greatest techniques of the high Baroque, probably never really to be played, just to be understood. Now, that work was dusted off 100 years after his death by a composer named Felix Mendelssohn, who said, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard, and resurrected it as the kind of music that we know and enjoy today. But he did not know that. He was dedicating himself to cultivating the beauty and potential of other people. He was serving those around him. He was getting on his upper branch. Bach is the sine qua non of happiness excellence by understanding that second curve. And what I want to do now is I want to show you, I want to demonstrate for you literally the piece that he was writing when he put down his pen and died. This was a textbook so beautiful, it's played in concert today. Imagine writing a textbook that's read as literature. That's what Bach was, was doing, but not for his own glory but rather for the good of others. This is the contrapunctus number three of Johann Sebastian Bach, which he wrote as he lay dying. May you be Bach and not Darwin. <laughs> May you go from strength to strength. Thank you. Over the next two days, we'll hear from scholars for what we are calling Ideas Out Loud. They will bring their research and work to life to help us deepen our understanding of happiness. For our first presentation, please welcome Dr. Charles Lim, a professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and chief of otology, neurotology, and skull base surgery at UC San Francisco to discuss music and the science of happiness. Uh, it's really great to see you all. I have to be honest with you, I kind of cringe at the idea of trying to tell anybody how to be happy. <laughs> and as I kind of struggled with the idea of what to say to you, I thought, well, what has made me ha happy in my life? And it's always been music. I'm a total music junkie. Through and through, every single thing I've done in my life revolves around sound. And, you know, I thought maybe a very simple answer, well, why music? This is the question, is that, well, we all love music. It all makes us happy. That's the end of it. And I thought that'd be a pretty short talk. And so what I'd like to do is take you on a very short journey about what music has meant for me and why I can view it as a source of happiness, even though a lot of that happiness is a result of the sadness that I think is inherent in the world. And now, we've all had the experience of listening to music. And so I want you to listen to music with me together. But I want you to think about it by entering my world. And this is my world. Okay, this is the temporal bone. This is the inner ear. And if you've never contemplated what happens in your body when you listen to music or how it's possible that you hear music, stare at this structure and right now know that this is enabling you to hear music and try to figure out what's happening as we listen to this together. Did you figure it out? Somehow, vibrations in the air 
went into our ear canals, vibrated our eardrums, vibrated three hearing bones, put those vibrations into a snail-shaped structure, set fluid into motion. That fluid triggered neurons to fire. All of a sudden, sound became electricity, traveled up a nerve, traveled into your brainstem, traveled to your brain, got reassembled as Beethoven's Ode to Joy. That's what happens when we listen to music. Now, for me, when I think about the profundity of that idea, I have to contend with the idea that music is fundamentally abstract. Melodies, harmonies, chords, rhythms, they don't mean anything, yet they can mean anything you want and everything to a certain person that is moved by music. By music. It's also a ubiquitous thing. Throughout the world, throughout history, there's always been music. Why? It doesn't help us survive. But there's always been music. We're hardwired to have music. I just told you what music really is. It's a biological fusion of vibration and electricity. That's a pretty like, elevated way to think of music, but maybe a more intuitive way to think about it is that it's an auditory representation of the whole range of human emotion. Any emotion I think that we've ever experienced in this world, in this life, music has it. And now, if that alone doesn't convince you about the universality of music, I want you to take a look at this bird. <laughs> Is that bird happy? I don't know, you tell me. That's a cockatoo named Snowball, who was studied by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ani Patel. And this is a beginnings of how we start to understand that the biology of music runs really, really deep. Now, if you start and you take this concept of music, the concept of, of emotion, you have to realize that they are like this. They are inextricably linked to one another which is an intriguing idea because so much of the world's music has been inspired by love. I think if you had to pick one topic that is always pervading in music, regardless of genre, regardless of nationality, it's always love. But love, interestingly, is not just a happiness emotion. We know that, right? How many of you have loved and never felt pain and sadness? That's maybe what gives the depth to the happiness that love brings us because it's immediately attached on the other side to the pain and sadness of it. And so I would say that if music is the universal language, which many people believe it is, it's not because it's good at conveying propositional thought. We couldn't have a lecture based on music. I couldn't sing or play a saxophone lecture to you. But it's because music conveys, it conveys every emotion and very excellently without any need for further explanation. Now, for those of you that like music and particularly like sad music, pause and think about that for a moment. Why do you like sad music? Why? We don't seek sadness in most of our life. We actually avoid it. But in music, you hear something sad, and you think, oh, that's so sad. I love it. It sounds so good. And there's a catharsis that happens. There's a musically, biologically based reward that happens. It's a separation of the consequences of the sadness from reality. You don't have to suffer to experience the suffering that the composer or the performer or the artist or the listener went through. And so as a result of that, what happens is that these sort of deep biological roots, and I, they're, they're actually very fundamental primitive areas in the brain, uh, are activated by music. They're stimulated in a way that gives you the experience of reward. And these are the same things that give us fear, love, arousal, sex, primitive things in our brains that fire when you're experiencing musical emotion. Now, we also have to contend with the fact that not all music has been born of happiness. Not all art has been. Um, so here are three very well-known paintings. These were not happy people. Okay? These are not happy paintings. These are paintings that were born of suffering and a reflection of mental illness. And so art, music, is often a reflection of, of suffering and disease. Now, we know that music reflects our emotion or can, but how to actually study that is not that clear. And so these are three faces I'm going to show to you. You might consider one as being negative and one as being positive and one as kind of being in the middle. And so as a uh, neuroscientist, one of the things I try to do is understand how in the brain these kinds of musical things can happen. And so what we did was we took musicians and we asked them to compose spontaneous music to faces that they were looking at, to try to target the emotion of the face in the music that they were playing. Now, it brings to mind, this is, a, uh, this is me actually demoing for you how we do these kinds of things. And so this is a functional MRI scanner. And so I've got a piano keyboard. And literally, you're in this brain scanner while your brain activity is being mapped while you're doing whatever you want, in this case, composing music. And to kind of um, get in the mind frame, it, it re reminds me of the fact that 
you can actually do a, an amazing thing in a functional MRI scanner because it does not care what you're doing. Okay? You set up the experiment however you want. It's agnostic to your behaviors. And what we found is that if you bring jazz musicians into a brain scanner and you have them play jazz, improvise, jam out, what happens is the conscious self-monitoring parts of the brain shut down. Okay? They're turning off conscious self-monitoring parts of the brain in order to allow this kind of free flow of creativity to unimpede a spontaneous idea. Now, how does the brain reflect musical emotion is kind of the follow-up to that. And it turns out that the simple idea of happy music is major, sad music is minor, it's sort of true, but sort of not true. And if you ask people to play music to a happy face, there's a lot of major in it, but there's also significantly about 20% of it's minor. Likewise, if you have them play sad music, about 70% of it is minor, but about 30% of it is major. What this is telling you is that these emotions are not that simple. They're not binary. They're actually more likely to be compound emotions. And I think it's the compound nature of emotion, but also maybe the compound duality nature of happiness that actually makes it more impactful. That you know that right on the other side is not happiness, but actually sadness. That's why the happiness has relevance. And if you look at the brain activity that's inspired by that kind of target, you can see that you're, again, this blue means deactivation. You're shutting down areas of your brain that are linked to conscious self-monitoring. However, it tends to be emotionally mediated. So the positive target, the happy face, when you're doing that kind of an improvisation, you are really turning off these conscious self-monitoring areas. But when you look at the negative emotion, the ambiguous emotion, actually it's not so. So what are we learning as a scientist? We're learning that emotional intent modulates the neurobiology of musical performance. And so that's something to think about for those of you that play music, but even if you don't play it, if you just listen to music, understand that the emotional context in which you are interpreting a piece of music, enjoying a piece of music, maybe hating a piece of music, is actually mediated by the neurobiology of your brain and the reward systems of your brain as they're interacting with this abstract thing that has no real meaning, yet is ultimately very significant to us. And as a scientist who studies the inner soul, I was kind of struck to hear Yo-Yo Ma say that being a musician is almost like being a scientist for the inner soul. And I think he's right. You know, what he's doing is plumbing the depths of human emotion and trying to articulate it back, trying to reflect it back to you in a way that you can understand what it was like for him to have lived and to have understood emotion. So in, in closing, I'd just like to say music can clearly inspire emotion. We know that. Okay? You, can, you can hear something great. You just heard Bach and you just thought that was inspiring. It can be inspired by emotion. It can be the product of emotion. You know that. People have suffered. People have had joy. And as a result, they wanted to express this in music. It can reinforce emotions that you already have. You're happy. You listen to something happy. You're sad. You listen to something sad. And it makes you feel better about that emotion. Ultimately, it can allow us to understand and empathize with one another. And if there's one thing I'm most grateful to music for, it's that music makes us less alone. And that's my answer about the question, why music? Thank you. For our next Ideas Out Loud to further discuss music and the science of happiness, please welcome Christina Myers, a board-certified music therapist at Four Diamonds at Penn State Health Children's Hospital. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to, to be with you today. I'm going to go ahead and take a seat, a little different than my other friends who are here. And we're going to talk a little bit today about music and using your music and being in tune, right? How can we purposely use our music that we connect to? And what kind of things do we need to think about? So my job as a board-certified music therapist is really to help guide people to have a deeper and more meaningful relationship with their music, whether that be through actively making music, being a musician yourself, or just being in a group choir or a drum circle, having that actual improvisational or group music making, 
or if it's just listening to music. What we do know is that the research tells us that these clinical interventions within a therapeutic relationship can really assist in expressing what you're feeling, right? That's what Dr. Lim was talking about. Expressing what you're feeling and finding an outlet for that. So what I'm going to invite you to do is to listen. I'm going to do a song for you, and I'm going to do it twice. And the first time, I want you to just listen in your most true sense. Be present with it. Look at the musical elements. Maybe that stand out to you. Maybe your physical reaction is something you're aware of. And last but certainly not least, your emotional response. And for our virtual audience, I invite you to do the same as well. I invite you to, to explore these while you listen. When I'm feeling alone and scared Wondering if anyone is there Look around, I will see Peace and love surrounding me Meet me in a place where the sun will shine A place to hold your smile and your eyes Go to a place that's filled with love Where peace is found and that is just enough I can feel the deepest joy Like a child with a brand new toy Flowing through me like the swell of waves Bringing light to every day So I still invite you to be aware of, of these elements, the music, your physical response, your emotional response. But this time, I'm going to give you an opportunity to look at the lyrics and to have the music in a little bit of a different feel. When I'm feeling alone and scared Wondering if anyone is there Look around and I will see Peace and love surrounding me Meet me in a place where the sun will shine A place to hold your smile and your eyes Go to a place that is filled with love Where peace is found and that is just enough I can feel the deepest joy Like a child with a brand new toy Flowing through me like the swell of waves Bringing light to every day So let's look at this. For our virtual audience, I invite you to answer in the polls and use the chat to describe what emotions you experienced, how did you feel it in your body. And for our audience here, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand and let us know which musical element were you most connected to. Did you connect to the rhythm? Feel free to raise your hands. Was it the melody? OK. 
Okay, so quite a few for Melody. What about the phrasing? The phrasing of how it fell. And the lyrics. Raise your hand if the lyrics was what felt powerful to you. Yes. And think about the two presentations. How did you feel in your body? What were some of those differences? Right? Were you drawn to, to your heartbeat, whether it was moving, giving some energy, or whether it was slower and kind of helping you find a moment of, of peace? We all have a song. We all have many songs that we connect to, right? Songs that bring us meaning, songs that stir a memory in us. And we connect to them for a particular reason. Being thoughtful about how we physically and emotionally respond to certain songs because of their musical elements helps us and invites us to use our music in a more purposeful way. So maybe you're looking for your songs to increase your energy. You might need things that have quicker rhythms, right? You might need something that has an increased beat per minute, right? Think of your cycling classes or your exercise classes, the music that they use is purposeful. Well, we can do that as well, right? We have the power to use the music that we connect to, to increase our energy or to increase our awareness and our presence. And so knowing how you're responding to music in these three ways, what stood out to you, how did it feel in your body, and the emotions that you experienced create an invitation for you to think about, well, what might I need? What might I need in my body? What might I want to feel? How can you cultivate that for yourself? And maybe looking at your music from a music side. What does my music carry? If I'm feeling like I'm connecting more to song lyrics, which there are times, song that we've heard 12 times sounds different because of our circumstances, because of where we are. And so being able to go ahead and use that for yourself. We're all drawn to different things, and that's perfectly wonderful. And that's the beauty of music. And so my invitation to you is to think about your music, right? The research tells us, we heard this whole beautiful morning was spent about telling us how, how your brain works to process this music. And so think about it. Think about a song that brings you motivation to move your body. And maybe it's the rhythm of it. Maybe it's the phrasing. Maybe it's the lyrics that provide you something. Think of another song a song that allows you to feel this overwhelming joy in however that looks like for you. And think about music that can foster a sense of peacefulness. Because for all of us, our soundtracks are different. And your soundtrack today is likely going to be very different than your soundtrack tomorrow. And that's the beauty of music, is there's so much to connect to and so much to choose from. And my job as a music therapist is to be really mindful about the cultural right, elements of music and how that connects to us, your spiritual connection to music. And so don't just think about the music that you use for exercise. Don't just think about the music you use for just to listen. Think about all the music that exists and how it's there for you and ways that then you can cultivate it and use it to find happiness and joy a little bit more purposely. Thank you. And now, joining Christina Myers, please welcome back to the stage Charles Lim and Arthur C. Brooks. Thanks for these beautiful presentations, uh, really informative and, and really touching my heart as a former musician, to be sure. We have a little bit of time now to hear what's on your mind. We've covered a lot of ground over the last hour, and we want to hear what questions that you have, comments that you have. We have a few minutes to do that before we go on with our program. We have two mics, so if you could, if you have something to say, please, and, and the important thing about the mic, despite the fact that we all hear each other in here, is that we have uh, 20,000 of our closest friends who are watching online. So please do use the mic. And as you're thinking about that, let me start with the moderator's prerogative and ask the following question. These beautiful presentations talk an awful lot about the happiness that comes from people listening to music, consuming music. What is the neurological and behavioral difference in happiness between playing music and listening to music? Um, that's a very 
deep and long question. Um, <laughs> let me try to... And our time is finished. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I think about it in terms of directionality, but also the level of passivity that one can have. So I think as a listener, you're, 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 in, you're an intake valve. And actually, I think of the brain this way. The brain is doing a few things. A large part of it is just taking in information. So if you think about the role of the brain, a large part is just gathering data. And so as a listener of music, that's what you're doing. You're gathering the data of the musical thing. And then it's reacting to, you're reacting to it, you're processing it. Now, playing music is an entirely different thing because it's based on a lot of not just who you are, but your training, your practice, your sort of skill set that's been involved. And then somehow taking this kind of very motorically complicated thing, cognitively challenging thing, yet making it seem effortless as a musician so that you're conveying an emotion. And so I think that there's a, a different directionality to the output of it as opposed to the input of it. Mm -hmm. And the neurobiology of that is just really being worked out now, but you can start to see the difference between the input and output arcs for music. Mm -hmm. If you were, as a, as a practicing scientist, if you were to, as a physician, if you were to prescribe for greater happiness to somebody an intervention that would have maximum efficacy and minimum time, would you recommend that they play a song or listen to a song? Um, okay, if you have zero musical background ever, I might tell Don't you... Don't try to play. Yeah, no, I might tell you to listen, but actually if you are open-minded, I'd tell you to try to write a melody for the first time in your life if you've never done it. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Behaviorally, what's the difference between them? I always think, you know, as a music therapist, my job is to manipulate the music, right? I'm looking at you and I'm responding to you musically. It's a musical conversation. And so, I agree. And even if you don't have any musical expertise, sing, sing in the shower, sing somewhere, engage in music, because that risk taking helps to decrease fear. Hmm. And when you decrease fear, you give more opportunity for self-love. So should you sing in front of another person, despite the fact that you, can, you can't even carry a tune? I don't think you need to, uh -huh. but there's something in making music with others, right? That helps us not be alone. Think about festivals, right? Oh. There are people who go to these wonderful electronic music festivals and everyone together, or at a concert, you are all experiencing it. And the likelihood is you're gonna hum along, you're gonna sing along. And it's that avenue of not being alone. It's being together in music. So actively making music, listening is beautiful. Actively making is beautiful too. We have a question from, from the audience, um, from Anita, who has a question for us about people trying to go in a completely new direction and trying something new. Of course, that's what I was talking about in my talk, but this is what we're discussing right here in, in terms of music. Is learning new skills, per se, important for the brain? Is learning about music, per se, the learning, the progress itself, actually the key to the happiness? Is this what you find in your intervention as a music therapist, and this is what you find as a neuroscientist? Yeah, I'll tell you that from my perspective, you have to be engaged in life. Every day you have to be engaged. And music is a robust image. If you actually look at the brain while you're listening to music, the entire brain is active. If you want a natural stimulant for your brain that's cognitively challenging and engaging, there's nothing better than music. And so, yes, I would say learning not just a new skill, but a musical new skill. There's, there's no reason why only kids should get the music lessons. Huh. Yeah. You agree? Yes, yeah. very much so. Yeah, very yeah, much yeah. so. Um, Ken Burns, the f wonderful filmmaker, was a new documentary on Benjamin Franklin. I interviewed him for my happiness column that comes out this Thursday, as a matter of fact. And I asked him, what is Benjamin Franklin's definition of happiness? And he said, lifelong learning in mm -hmm. pursuit of self-improvement, which is what you both just told me. You're both just Benjamin Franklin, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, um, I guess we all should be so lucky. We have one. We're going to finish off this session with um, a, a live question. The mic is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, first of all, kudos to each of you for fantastic presentations. Um, I'm really taken by the notion of the uh, happiness 401k, and I saw like lots of heads of approximately my age, you know, bobbing along. Is, is we're all thinking about, you know, how to get on that second curve. Yeah. How would you translate this information to impart it to a younger audience, so that? There could be some, you know, maybe preemptive yeah. preparation for, you know, for making that transition and understanding that life is going to have a couple of, at least a couple of curves along the way. Yeah. One of the beautiful things about happiness that we find is that whereas the 401k plan for your money requires current deferral of gratification, it requires current sacrifice, the 401k for happiness actually makes you happier all along the way. It's a win-win. There is no sacrifice. And so you can... 
not leave your happiness up to chance. There's things that you can do that remarkably change your odds of being happier at 75 than you were at 25 that you can start when you're 25 or 45 or 65. And no matter when you start, the better off you actually get. There is literally, with proper happiness hygiene, no way to lose. And that's how I talk about it with my students. At, and they're not just Harvard Business School students. I talk about it with students all over the country. It's, a, it's the quintessential win-win of a transcendental life. My friends, we're, we've come to the end of this session, appropriately ending on music, which is the most beautiful thing that I've ever experienced, and I know that you've all enjoyed it as well. We're going to go on to adventure after adventure in our own uh, search for, as seekers of happiness, the kinds of things that we can learn for ourselves and pass on to other people. So we'll, we'll, we'll go on with our program today. Please join me in thanking our two wonderful speakers. live Dear Therapist session, please welcome Atlantic contributing writer Laurie Gottlieb, here with Atlantic senior editor Kate Julian. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Kate Julian. I'm an editor and writer at The Atlantic, where it's been my great privilege over the years to get to know Lori. Most of you probably know her as a brilliant psychotherapist, as the author of Maybe You Should Talk to Somebody, and as the um, beloved advice columnist who writes our Dear Therapist, Therapist column. Today, we are going to talk a bit about why therapy is so important. And then we are going to do a little bit of live Dear Therapist um, with you all. So if you are following along at home, please submit your questions, your advice questions, via the Q&A tab. And if you are here in the audience, we will have a chance to ask questions uh, via the mic later. And I encourage you to ask everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, feel free to say that you're asking for a friend. We can assume that everything is for a friend. Um, or hypothetical. Or hypothetical. <laughs> for example, if this were to happen. Um, Lori, uh, I was actually about to say, I wish I'd had the foresight to, to come up with a couple of anonymous questions of my own to have someone put in on the app. Um, <laughs> <laughs> before, before we get to the live advice, though, I'd like to set the stage a bit by talking a bit about why it is so important to normalize therapy. This is something that you've been so eloquent on over the years. Um, you, so the general gist is I think that we tend to equate too often mental health and mental illness. And that means that people don't want to um, talk about it, right, when they're getting treatment or that, that would help them with their mental health. But, but, but could, could you just talk a bit about how much is this actually really still an issue? Like in 2022, like how much yeah. stigma is there really around therapy? I think there's still a lot of stigma. I think it's getting better. But I think it, part of it has to do with the difference between how we view physical health and how we deal emotional health. And notice that I'm using the word health and not illness. Mm. Um, because I think it's really important when you think about, we have this sort of hierarchy of pain when it comes to emotional health that we don't have with physical health. So if you fall down and break your arm, you're probably gonna go to the doctor and get an x-ray and get a cast and not be like, but I don't have stage four cancer, so I'm just gonna like tough it out with my arm, right? So we don't do the hierarchy, but we do that with our emotional health. We say, well, yeah, I've been a little bit sad or anxious or I'm having trouble in a relationship, um, I'm having trouble sleeping, I can't figure out my career direction, whatever it is. We, you know, we do this hierarchy in our head, like, well, it's not as bad as whatever the thing is in your head. I can keep going. Right? So it's fine. I have a roof over my head and food on the table, so it's not that bad. And it's kind of like if you were having 
chest pain, right? You'd probably go get it checked out before you had a heart attack. Um, what, what happens in therapy is people come to me when they're having the equivalent of an emotional heart attack. So they've waited that long, and two things happen at that point. One is, um, you know, it's harder to treat because now we have to get, now it's gotten really bad. Mm. And we have to get them back to sort of where it was when they should have called in the first place. But the other thing is that, and this is where sort of my heart goes out to them, they've struggled unnecessarily often for like months or even years when they didn't need to struggle that much. So I really feel like therapy is about getting a, a really good second opinion on your life from someone who isn't in your life, and why should there be shame around that? It's, it's so interesting because we talk about all the progress that we've made on this, right? But we still don't. I mean, I'm thinking of your analogy of, of sort of the heart condition, right? We still don't say at work, I've got to leave at 4.30 on Tuesday because I've got therapy. We say, I've got an appointment, or I've got to go to the <laughs> dentist, right? Um, and I do think, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how to sort of normalize caregiving obligations, right? Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter talks very uh, eloquently about how we have to say when we're going to do something for a parent or a kid, but we haven't really gotten there with mental health yet, and I think that would, that would help a lot. I'm wondering if you could just give us, like, the quick sort of scientific sale on therapy. Right, so like, you know, the, me the, the sort of the evidence. Yeah, I, yeah. so I'm not, I'm not gonna sell therapy. I just, I think that if you're, you know, people always say to me like, I'm not sure if I should go to therapy. Yeah. And I feel like if you're asking yourself if you should go to therapy, that's your inner therapist telling you you should go to therapy. <laughs> so, so there's your answer. And I also think, and I'll, I'll give an, an anecdotal and not a yeah. scientific um, kind of reason that I think therapy is really useful. And I think that's because in, in my book, and I've talked about this a lot in other writing, that there's this difference between between idiot compassion and wise compassion. Mm -hmm. And what you get outside of therapy is idiot compassion. Idiot compassion is when you go to your friends and you say, listen to what happened with my husband, my wife, my best friend, my sibling, my mother, whatever it is, my boss. And we say, yeah, they're wrong, you're right, that's terrible, right? That's idiot compassion. We back them up because we think that we're being supportive. Um, but what happens is if you listen to people over time, sometimes you'll hear like that they're complaining about these kinds of things a lot, maybe different characters, different situation. It's almost like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. We do not say that to our friends. We listen and we say, yeah, you're right. That's so, that's so terrible. If you come to a therapist, what you're gonna get is wise compassion. And in wise compassion, we hold up a mirror to you and we help you to see something about yourself and your role in the situation that maybe you haven't been willing or able to see. And so the word compassion is still there. It's wise compassion, it's very compassionate. But you're going to therapy not to be validated because something is not working. You will get validation there, but you're also going to be challenged to look at your agency and look at your role in a different way so that it can open up more possibilities for you. And so does that translate into people coming into therapy for the first time with really mismatched expectations of what it's going to be? Like, what would you say sort of a therapy um, newbie kind of finds their <laughs> expectations are versus the reality? Um, I think that for many people, therapy is incredibly helpful, no matter what their expectations are. And I think that if they come in and they're expecting that the therapist is just going to back up everything they say, that's something that gets discussed in therapy. The beauty of therapy is that there is nothing that doesn't get discussed. So all of those things that out in the world we feel like, oh, I can't bring that up, everything is brought up there. Everything is fair game. And that's where you really have the freedom to talk about the hard things that you maybe can't talk about outside, including your relationship with your therapist. That you know you are upset about something the therapist said, you bring it up. Because it's going to mirror, in some way, something about the way you interact with the people in your life outside of the room. I, I wanted to ask you a question, actually, about the way we interact with people in life outside the room. And that is, you know, there seems to be this um, you know, linkage of loneliness to a failure to self-disclose, right? The failure to share our problems, um, yeah. to talk with other people. And I, I'm curious sort of what your insights are on like which leads to which, right? Like are lonely people unlikely to share their problems or do people who are unlikely to share their problems become lonely? Yeah, well I should say loneliness is, you know, very heavily linked with depression. And um, so, and I think that when we talk about loneliness, people often think, well, I'm not lonely because mm -hmm. I'm surrounded by people. 
but that doesn't mean that you're not lonely. What is the quality of those relationships and, and how vulnerable can you be in those relationships and how much can you be present and have someone be present for you? And I should say too that social media is very confusing around this because people will post something on Instagram like, you know, oh, well, let me tell you about like this thing that I've gone through, and it's so personal. And and they, but you're putting it out to strangers, and then everyone likes it, right? And I think on the one hand, okay, it reduces stigma a little bit, but but it's not at all taking the kind of risk that you have to take when you sit face to face with someone in your life who matters to you, um, and you say, hey, I want to tell you something about my inner experience, and this is really scary for me. That is so much more scary. Right. than posting on Instagram this thing that is quote unquote brave. And, and the thing that's really pernicious about Instagram, right, is that by doing that and getting that sort of very small bit of feedback, you're kind of taking away the appetite for the real thing. It's like snacking on junk food exactly. and then never getting the meal. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I did want to sort of talk a bit about um, access to therapy, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously we have really different rates of access and um, you know, uh, uh, uptake in terms of therapy um, across the country. And I'm wondering sort of what your observations are on that, what we can do about it. Yeah. Well, you know, it, that is a huge problem. And I think that what I'm trying to do in my work is sort of democratize therapy and give access. So, you know, when I wrote maybe you should talk to someone, I wanted to bring people into the therapy room so that they could have an experience by seeing themselves mirrored in the people that I'm writing about. And by the way, in my book, I'm a patient in the book too, is I go to therapy. So I think it really normalizes the experience and also helps people to get a taste of that experience and ask themselves the same kinds of questions that they would be asked in therapy. Um, I have a podcast called Dear Therapist where we do actual sessions with people. If you want to be on the podcast, you can write into it. Um, and so it gives people, again, the experience of, of what that's like. The column, of course, in the Atlantic gives people an avenue for exploring those things. I also think that a lot of people are not aware that in most major cities, there are clinics where you can get low fee to no fee um, psychotherapy with trainees. And people say, oh, I don't want to go to an intern or a trainee. That's how we become therapists. And we're all supervised by very experienced clinicians. And it's a great way if you, um, if you don't have access to therapy to go to your local clinic. And a lot of people are just not aware that they exist. And they do exist. So I want people to know about them. I think with that note, it's a great time to move, move into the sort of uh, democratizing part of our session here. Um, I do want to remind people at home, if you are able to um, put a question in, we would especially love some questions that are really specific scenarios, not, not more general things, but you know, this happened or this is bothering me types of things. That will be um, fun <laughs> to answer. Before we, before we dive into that, though, I, I wanted to sort of give Lori an opportunity to talk about a couple of the themes um, that come up most commonly in the questions that you receive. Because I know that a lot of them are about romantic relationships. Um, one that I'm particularly cur curious to hear you talk about has to do with vulnerability and gender dynamics. And I'll maybe toss mm. it to you and let, us, let you tell us a bit more about what's going on there. Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I, you know, I do see when we were talking about stigma earlier that I think for men, there's even more stigma. And so when people come into the therapy room, I see, you know, and this is a, a generalization, but I've seen it over so many years where men will come in and they will say, you know, I've never told anyone this before. And they literally have not told a soul. They've told no one. If women come in and they say that, they'll say something like, oh, you know, I've never told anyone this before. It's really hard for me. And it turns out that actually they've told like, you know, I've never told anyone except for my sister, my mother, my best friend, right? So they've told maybe like one to three people, but they feel like they haven't told anyone. So I think the difference is that for men, there really is not one person that they feel comfortable opening up to. Whereas for women, there might be one or two or three people, but they still feel like, it's private and they haven't told a lot of people. And, and I should say too, when I see couples, and if it's a heterosexual couple, often what'll happen is the woman will say to the man, I really wanna get close to you, I feel like there's this disconnection between us, I want you to share your inner life with me and open up. And then right there in the room in front of me, he does. And maybe he starts tearing up, and maybe he starts really crying. And you see her not knowing what to do with this. Like she looks at me like a deer in headlights. And, and what comes out is this kind of thing like, I don't feel safe when you don't share with me because I feel disconnected from you. But, but I, I don't feel safe when you're crying hysterically in front of me either <laughs> because our culture has taught men that this is not 
how they're supposed to present. So I think that we need to, when we think about men and stigma, we need to think how can we make it comfortable for them as well if we're asking them to be vulnerable, how can we allow the space for them to be vulnerable? Absolutely. I, just very quickly, do you see any generational difference or progress on that? Is that any, any less salient kind of for younger men or? Um, a little bit, not much. Not much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think with that, we will go to the live question, live Dear Therapist part of, our, um, part of our program. I've got a couple of questions from the online audience. And if anybody would like to come up to the mic and ask a question in the room, that would be wonderful. Please For a it. friend. For a friend, <laughs> <laughs> hypothetically. Um, the first question that we have from online uh, is, is a bit general, but I think it's a really important issue. H how, does this re uh, how this viewer asks, do you deal with profound betrayal, whether it's a friend, a relative, a colleague, a spouse? Mm -hmm. um, do you have you know, a few thoughts that you could share that might apply to some of those different scenarios? Yeah, um, you know, I think betrayal is just so painful. Um, because it's the core of the trust of the relationship and trust is the glue of the relationship. And so when you're betrayed, suddenly you feel unsafe with the person that you were supposed to feel the most safe with. And normally when you feel unsafe in the world, you go to that person to feel safe, but now who do you go to? And I think one of the problems is that we go to our friends and then our friends say, oh, that person's terrible, they betrayed you, you should leave them, and they don't really know what's going on in the relationship. And so the person who's betrayed has to navigate not only the betrayal in the relationship, but then all the external pressure that people are putting on them because they've shared this information that maybe they wish they hadn't shared so much. The next question that we're looking at from the audience has to do with um, sort of what you see as the best advice for somebody who has to accept a thing that they can't change, in this case, um, a child with a developmental delay. Um, that is just a, you know, a fact. Like, what, what, can this, um, what can this viewer take from you? Yeah. The thing about that is that a lot of people don't understand what they're going through. And then a lot of people feel like if they go through a grieving process, and the grieving process is not that you don't love your child. The grieving process is that it's kind of like there was a plot twist that you didn't expect. And your life, you thought when you had this child it was going to look this way, but now it's going to look this way. And it's an adjustment because it's, it, 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 there's a lot of uncertainty. What does it mean for my child's future? What does it mean for my child now at school? What does it mean? Um, you know, for our family. And so I think that there is some grieving and some loss involved and then moving on to a place of, of really embracing where you are. And other people say a lot of things, just like when someone has a, has a medical diagnosis and they don't know how, what to say and they say the most unsupportive things and under the guise of trying to be supportive, people try to manage their own discomfort um, instead of saying, what do you need? How can I help? And that's what people yeah. really want to hear. Yeah. I think we've got a question in the audience. Uh, yeah, there's something you said that really resonated with me earlier. Um, I'm in therapy, full disclosure. And recently I've been looking into my family history and my great grandfather, my grandfather, my dad, they all have um, what I would view as depression, in some cases, substance abuse. But there is this history of not talking about it and not valuing therapy. Um, as, as a daughter and as someone that's com compassionate for these men, is there anything that I can do to, to help encourage them or make them feel safe or make them see the value in therapy? Yeah, thank you for that question. Family secrets are incredibly toxic. And, and often the family secret exists because they think that they're protecting someone from the information, that if they don't have this information, it will help them. But actually, it hurts them. And, and kids know that there's some secret in the family, even if you, you know, think, oh, I've really hid this secret. Um, they feel it. There's something in the air that feels just not right. And when they grow up and they discover the secret, and they usually will, um, they feel very betrayed by that. And they would have liked to have known it. Um, mental health issues are often something that is a big secret in, in a family. And a lot of intergenerational trauma that needs to be talked about just 
gets passed down instead of stopped. So I'm glad that you're talking about it because that's the first step in really ending the intergenerational trauma. And in terms of helping other people get more comfortable with it, um, you know, talking about your own experience. I've been to therapy and I'm finding it so helpful. So it's not you should go to therapy, it's just I'm finding this so helpful, it's really freeing me up in these ways. Um, I think just plants a seed in people's heads about what might be possible for them. We have um, another related question uh, from a viewer at home who says, my mom needs would benefit from therapy to address childhood trauma but refuses to go. How can I get her um, more open to this possibility? Mm -hmm. That's such a common question. People want to get other people into <laughs> therapy. <laughs> We always have, we have this, you know, when I, when I see people who do come to therapy, I always say before diagnosing someone with depression, make sure they aren't surrounded by assholes. So, so this is why people want to get the other people into therapy. Not that her mom is an asshole, but she's probably not easy. Um, you can't get somebody else into therapy. Um, but what you can do is you can educate them in a way with your own experience. Again, what I'm talking about is when people hear that a lot of people are around them are going to therapy and that they're really benefiting from it, um, it might make them more open to exploring that. Um, they need to know that maybe if you go for one session of therapy, it doesn't mean you're in therapy. It means it's just you're going to see what it's like. Um, and maybe demystifying a little bit what therapy is, because I think a lot of people think that therapy is you go in, you talk about your childhood ad nauseum, you leave, you come back, you do the same thing the next week. Therapy is actually a very active process, and it's very present and future focused. And a lot of the work of therapy happens between sessions. So you go to therapy, you learn something about yourself, you, you go do something different outside of therapy. Like a couple, you know, somebody will say to me, oh look, I understood why I got in that fight with my partner over the weekend. And I'll say, well, did you do something different? And they'll say, well, no, but I understand why I did that. We always like to say that insight is the booby prize of therapy, that you can have all the insight in the world, but if you don't do something different out in the world, the insight is useless. So um, once they know sort of what therapy is, it sometimes makes it a little bit less scary, but I would really give up on the idea of trying to get someone to go to therapy and change your own response to how you are when you're around them. I think we have another question from the audience on this side. Um, over the last few months, I've heard more and more about and seen more about life coaching. And I was just curious how you see the difference between coaching and therapy and when you kind of guide people to either one. I think that anytime somebody wants to explore something about how they are in the world, it's great. So I think if you want to go to a life coach, that's great. If you want to go to a therapist, that's great. Um, I think they're very different in terms of what you're going to get at each of them. A life coach is probably more um, pragmatic. And in therapy, it's also very pragmatic, but you're, you're really looking at longstanding patterns and you're looking about um, processing experiences that live inside of you. You know, there's a, there's a big mind-body connection and a lot of trauma and a lot of unprocessed experiences and feelings um, are going to persist if you don't move through them and you will repeat a lot of patterns. So you might, in the short term, benefit from a life coach, but I think in the long term, therapy will give you that, that sort of longer term benefit. We have another question from a viewer at home who asks how he or she can live with complete estrangement from a child. Um, mm -hmm. It's been, in this case, unilaterally imposed by the child. The child's a young adult and hasn't shared what the problem is. One of the most popular Dear Therapist columns was from a father who wrote in and said that he, um, you know, his daughter wouldn't talk to him. And one of our most popular Dear Therapist podcasts, separate person, um, it was heartbreaking because you, you actually hear the session and you hear him. Um, you know, estrangement is a big deal. And I think that a lot of the, the younger generation now, again, on social media, you know, people say, oh, that person is toxic. You should never talk to them again. And I think that's so dangerous because there are certainly circumstances where it's reasonable to say, I'm going to cut off that person because it's 
not manageable. Um, but I think sometimes people do that when they haven't really explored what is possible. You know, often people say to me in therapy, how can I have a relationship with my abusive parents? And I'll say, well, first of all, they have to stop being abusive. Yeah. So, but you don't know if they can or can't do that until you actually see what's possible. And a lot of times the parents don't really know what they're doing. And by the way, maybe what you're calling abuse, right, is really just they're very difficult. Um, so I think it's really sad when people do that and they haven't really explored what's possible. Um, it doesn't affect just those two people. It affects the whole family. It affects like who's going to go to what family occasion and who's there and who's not there. It affects like the grandkids who now maybe won't know their grandparents. Um, so you know, I, I, I think that what I would do is I would write that daughter a letter. Um, and if they go back to that Dear Therapist column, there's like I actually give a letter that he could write. Um, and it's really a no pressure letter. It's a, it's a taking responsibility. It's I know that I must have done something to upset you so much that it's impossible for you to have me in your life. But I'd be really curious to hear your experience because I don't think that I've really been open to your experience before. And then when you get that, if, if the person responds and they give you their experience, you don't defend. You don't say, oh, but I did that because this, or it didn't happen that way. Because their perspective is their perspective, and they feel like they haven't been heard, and that's why they keep pushing you out. I think that's a pretty great note to end on, actually. Um, thank you so much, Lori, for joining us. Um, and thanks especially to everybody who wrote in or um, joined us in the audience to, to share personal scenarios and ask questions. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. And now for a session produced by our underwriter, the John Templeton Foundation. There are a lot of big mysteries that get us up in the morning. What's the origin of the universe? There was, after all, the Big Bang. But what created the Big Bang? Where does time start? Where does it go? Where is the data? What do we know now? How come there is matter in the universe? How is technology changing who we are? What is character development? Is it possible to teach humility? If it was a God who cared about human beings, what was that God like? How do we enhance who we are individually and societally? I mean, the purpose of man is a huge question. What is the very nature of human love? How do we love each other better? These are some of the deep questions that we're trying to figure out. We want to understand not just how we came to be here, we want to understand is there some meaning, is there some purpose, what should we be doing with our time? If you don't understand what the end of a human being is, what is the purpose of a human being, then you're not going to have a civilization that helps people to thrive humanly. We have a continuing fascination and excitement with the natural world, with this ability that we have, which is a wonderful ability, to look up there, to look down into the very small, and to learn continually about the wonderful things that are hidden from us as we unveil more and more of the natural world. Such magic out in the forest, and it just is a feeling of spirituality. You know, it's something so powerful and so much beyond what even the most scientific, brilliant brain could have created. These amazingly beautiful things that are hiding just under the surface that science can uncover, whether it's a, a differential equation or some elegant biochemical uh, structure, that's awe-inspiring, that's beautiful, that lifts you up out of the mundane nature of what we might have thought looking at that structure before we had science to reveal it. There's a quality of the world that unites us all together, which is the, the urge that we all have to understand the world, the urge that we all have to see whether that understanding can enrich our lives. Everybody cares about that. And now for a wellness moment with Arthur C. Brooks. 
how to manage your feelings so they don't manage you. Here's where we start. Each day this coming week, set aside 15 minutes in the evening, after the end of your day, well, before you go to bed, of course, but, but where your day is more or less behind you. Now, think a little bit about the strongest negative basic emotion you had today. Was it anger? Were you sad? Did you feel disgusted? Were you afraid? Think about it. Observe it as if it had happened to somebody else. State the emotion out loud and its context specifically. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're having kind of a health challenge. Everybody does from time to time. And it's giving you some fear, some anxiety about the future. You might say, today after lunch, I felt kind of afraid because I thought about the medical tests that I have coming up with my doctor. I thought about it for about an hour and I thought about really all the worst case scenarios. I kind of ruminated on them. I even Googled my symptoms. Now don't judge yourself. Don't judge your feelings. Don't judge your actions. Just observe them in this way and state them out loud. This is what happened. Second, Let's analyze the feeling that you had as if you were doing it for somebody else, a close friend. For example, say, look, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know what the outcomes might be. That uncertainty that I feel about this problem is the, is the reason I thought about the worst case scenarios. What was I doing? I was really trying to explore the possibilities so I could manage them emotionally. That's what I was doing. But here's the thing. I found it didn't help at all because I didn't learn anything. In fact, I think it made me feel a little worse. And I wasted a bunch of my time. Now, move on to step three. Manage the feeling with a positive resolution. For example, say, you know, a much better way for me to deal with this anxiety I have about these medical tests is to say to myself, I don't know what these tests are gonna reveal, but I'm gonna know soon enough now, it's on a long list of uncertain things in the world. There's so many things that I don't know. I'm gonna to choose to focus on what I do know. And what I do know is that I'm alive and well right now. And I do know that I will not waste the gift that is this moment. I will not waste my time after lunch tomorrow, which can be spent doing generative, creative things and maybe showing love to other people. Now, don't forget to put the resolution into practice. One good way to do it is to write down your resolution, your resolution about how you're going to deal with your feelings tomorrow, and then put an alarm on your phone to remind you to actually think about your resolution proactively so your mind doesn't wander in this darker direction. Do this every day for a week, by which I mean every day after dinner, but before you go to bed, do this 15 minute activity. Sometimes it will be the same negative emotions. These are hard to get rid of. Don't kid yourself, this is not a one day deal. Sometimes there'll be different emotions, that's okay. But stick with the exercise. If you make this a routine, if you stick with this for three weeks to a month, I promise you, you're gonna be amazed at the level of self-management you attain because you're gonna get better and better at it like any other skill. Are you gonna be perfect? No, of course not. And you will still have negative emotions, which you need to have. But at the same time, as time goes on, you'll be more and more the one in charge and your happiness will rise. While we're on a break, we encourage you to network with other attendees and visit our expo booths. Next, click join and you'll be randomly paired with another attendee for about five minutes. If you wish, you can exchange virtual information with each other and keep in contact via direct message within the platform. You can also click the explore icon, visit our virtual expo booths. Here you can explore more resources from the Atlantic and our underwriters related to today's event. We'll see you shortly after the break.